to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And you can take your red ribbon there and you can put it there because we'll be staying here. And I promise you, if I take you somewhere else, it'll be on the screen. So uh, make sure you stick right there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, to our members, you know it's always wonderful to see you. To anyone who's visiting here, may God bless you for being with us. And I pray that you find our study and our worship to be, to be profitable to you. The most important thing that we can do in life is understand what God wants from us to do it. To understand how to be saved by Him. And hopefully, I pray, that is what we're going to learn a little bit more about today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Read with me in verse 1. The Bible says this. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. This morning is a day that, that, that our country at large understands and recognizes the wonderful resurrection of Christ. We, we memorialize him every Sunday. And so this morning, I do want to talk a little bit about, about the resurrection of Christ. And I want to talk to you about what it means to us as Christians, what it, what it proves to us. But before I talk about that story, I do need to tell you about another story But first. I want to tell you about a story, kind of an innocuous story uh, in my life, but for, for some reason it is just burned into my memory. And I think it's really helpful for understanding what we're going to talk about. So back when I lived in Orlando, when I was a young boy, I was about seven, eight, or nine years old, I had the opportunity one Saturday to go help a neighbor, neighbor lady work around her house and earn some cold, hard cash. I'm really excited about that as a kid because as a kid you always want cash so you can buy really important things like candy and baseball cards and baseball cards and baseball cards. And so I'm really excited about this. I'm getting really pumped up to go work for her on Saturday. And I ride my bike over to her house and once I get there, I realize just how much work she's got for me to do. She's got a whole slate of work prepared for me. I thought it was going to be a couple hours in the morning. I could play the rest of the day. But she had the whole day planned out. She had so much stuff. And so I got to work. And I kept working. And while I did that, even though it was more than I expected, I wasn't discouraged. I encouraged myself because I was confident. I knew there was a reward that was coming. And I was excited about that. So I picked up twigs from her yard and pine cones and I weeded her flower beds and I cleaned off her whole driveway and, and did all the other stuff that she wanted me to do that she'd planned for me to do. And at the end of all of that, the end of the day, what was supposed to be a couple of hours ended up being the whole day, she, she and I met in the driveway so I could receive my reward. When we did, she pulled out her wallet and she handed me three one dollar bills. Three one dollar bills for the whole day of work. And if you know me, you know I am absolutely incapable of hiding my emotions. And so she knew exactly how I felt about it. And so she looked at me. I was crestfallen. And, and she said, she said, well, well do you think I, I should give you some more? And I said, uh-huh. And so she reached into her wallet and out of the depths of her generosity, she handed me one more dollar bill. Needless to say, she and I, our schedules never quite matched up on another Saturday. I don't quite know how that happened. She had trouble locking me in for another, another Saturday work day. I wasn't excited about working for her. I was discouraged about working on her house because I knew, I knew that the reward wasn't worth the price. That had been made clear to me. I didn't want to work for her because I had no confidence in the reward I would receive. Sometimes we wrestle with the question. Am I sure that the, the reward is going to be worth the price that I have to pay? That's not just a question that we struggle with in finances and with work for neighbor ladies. But that's a question that we really struggle with when it comes to Christianity sometimes. Christianity is a high calling. Don't let, don't let anyone tell you that it's not. 
God calls us to a new life, a transformed life. He calls us to, to improved character and holiness. He calls us to be like him, to go out into the world and to seek and save the lost. That is a high calling. Christianity requires a lot of us. It requires sacrifices. And sometimes in the life of a Christian, at some point in the life of every Christian, we ask ourselves the question, am I sure... Am I sure that the reward is worth the price? How can I be sure that everything I have to give up to be a Christian is worth the reward I'm going to get for being a Christian? Are you sure about your reward? Do you have confidence in your reward? And the, and the question that we have to ask ourselves really is, how can, how can I be confident? How can I know that all of this is going to be worth it in the end? And the answer that I want to I put before you this morning is this. The answer, the reason I can be confident that everything I give up is going to be worth what I gain, the reason I can know that is because Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection is my confidence. The resurrection is my hope. The, resu the, the, the resurrection is my assurance. It is my proof that everything I give up to be a Christian is worth it in the end. The resurrection assures us that our work is not in vain. It proves that the reward is worth the price. And so this morning, what I want to talk to you about is I want to talk to you about what the resurrection proves. I want to show you why why the resurrection is the thing we hold on to, and how it proves to us that everything we give up as a Christian is worth, is worth the reward we will receive. I want to give you three things this morning, and really, really, I want to give you one big thing, but it's three things. The first two kind of build on each other, leading to the third one. So let me give you three things, two quickly, and then one big one. Three things that the resurrection proves. First of all, I want to show you, I want to show you that the resurrection of Jesus proves this conclusively, that Jesus was, he was God's son. Will you look again at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 4? The res resurrection proves that Jesus was God's son. It proves he was the Messiah. He was the Savior sent into the world. He was the person everybody prophesied about. He was who he said he was. Notice what it says in verses 3 and 4, right? For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And what those two similar phrases, according to the Scriptures, what they point to is the fact that what happened to Jesus was not something that, was, that, that, that hadn't been talked about. What happened to Jesus was something that had been prophesied and promised. Those who are waiting for the Messiah would have read these passages. They would have known that people, people had been promised this by God and by his prophets. Like what's written in Psalm 16 and verse 10. All the way back there, Psalm of David, it says, You will not abandon my soul to Sheol. Nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. One of the things that was promised about the Messiah was that the Messiah would not decay in the grave. That he wouldn't stay dead. And the resurrection proves, because, because Jesus rose from the grave, it proves that he was the Holy One that David wrote about in Psalm 16. The Apostle Paul would write this in another place about what the resurrection proves. Romans 1 he says, concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared, declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. According to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The resurrection of Jesus declares with power that he was the son of God. Time and time again, during the life of Christ, the crowds would ask Jesus, why should we trust you? Why should we believe what you say? Why, why shouldn't we stone you when you say you're the son of God? Why, we sh why shouldn't we just put you to death? Who gave you authority to say these things? And Jesus' answer, uh, he gave many answers, but the main answer he gave was this. The one he gave in John 2 in verse 19. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. You want to know why you should listen to me? Why you should know that I have authority? Why I really do come from God? You should listen to me because you're going to tear apart my body. You're going to destroy me completely. You're going to ruin me entirely. You're going to do your worst. You're going to do all the things that a person can do to a human body. And guess what? In three days, I'll be back. 
the resurrection of Jesus validates everything that he says. Proves that he is who he said he was. And it gives us reason to believe everything else that he said. You know, sometimes our hearts can, can get filled with doubt. And we can think to ourselves, I'm not sure. I'm not sure Christianity is worth it. I'm not sure that the reward is going to be worth the sacrifice because, because honestly, I'm not sure if Jesus Christ is the Son of God. From time to time, the Christian heart is going to entertain those doubts. But the resurrection proves to us that we don't need to worry about those doubts. It proves to us, it puts those doubts to rest. It shows us that we're right to trust in him. It shows us that Jesus wasn't a fraud. It shows us that the reward will be worth the sacrifice. Because we know, we know with certainty that Jesus was crucified on the cross of Calvary. And we know with certainty that he died on that cross. And we know with certainty that he he rose from the dead. We know the tomb was empty and no one in Jerusalem could find the body. He wasn't there. Why seek the living among the dead? And we know that his disciples, his disciples testified that they saw him again under intense persecution, under torture, even to the point of death. They maintained that they saw him again. We can be assured that Jesus rose from the dead. And because of that, that resurrection gives us assurance that Jesus really was who he said he was. And if that's true, if Jesus really was who he said he was, the resurrection proves something else. It proves, it proves that salvation, salvation is possible. Jesus' resurrection proves that salvation is possible. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12, Paul starts writing to the Corinthians about what the consequences would be if Jesus died but never rose. Read with me there. This is what he says. This is what life looks like if Jesus died and never rose from the dead. Now, if Christ has preached, verse 12, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised... Your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. If Christ never rose, that would mean that would mean that he wasn't our savior. That would mean that he wasn't able to save us like he said he would. I promise you I wouldn't take you somewhere else. So I'm just going to think about it and quote it because it occurred to me during the Lord's Supper. The verse that was up there as we were taking the fruit of the vine talked about how Christ through death rendered powerless he who had the power of death. Because men sin, Satan has power over men. Satan has power over all of us because we sin. But what Christ did is when he died, he rendered Satan's power useless. He nullified it. And that means that he doesn't have power over those who are saved. Those who find salvation in Jesus are not, are not subject to the power of Satan in death. He releases us from that. And he proved that he had power over Satan by rising from the dead, by overcoming what Satan's power is, the power of death. When Christ rises from the dead, he says... Satan doesn't have power over me. If you find salvation in me, he doesn't have power over you. Romans 4 and verse 25. He was delivered over because of our transgressions. He was raised because of our justification. Christ was given to men to be crucified on the cross in order to, 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 to work our salvation. To, to, to cleanse our sins, right? By his stripes we are healed. He was delivered over because of our transgressions, but he was raised for our justification. He was raised to prove that through him we can be made right with God. 
Peter would write this in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life, inherited from your forefathers. We don't buy our salvation with physical things. That's the point. You didn't buy your salvation with gold or silver. Here's how your salvation was bought, with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. We don't often read the next verses, but let's read them today. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he has appeared in these last times. For the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope would be in God. Jesus died on the cross, and God raised him up, and God glorified him. And why did God raise him up? So that your faith and hope would be in God. So that you know with certainty that salvation is possible for you. You know, sometimes our hearts are filled with doubt and discouragement. Not because we doubt Jesus, but because we know who we are. And we think to ourselves, you know, the... the the sacrifices of Christianity aren't going to be worth it for me because the truth is I'm, never, I'm, I'm not the kind of person who would ever get that reward. The way that I live my life, the things I've done, the person that I am, there's no way salvation is possible, is possible for me. And what the resurrection proves is that's just not true. The resurrection gives any person, no matter, no matter how they've lived or what they've done, gives any person confidence that salvation is possible because Christ rendered powerless the one who had the power of death. The resurrection proves that salvation is possible for anyone. The reward will be worth the sacrifice. And if that's true, if Jesus was God's son and he does make salvation possible, then if he truly did rise from the tomb, it proves this. It proves that we will rise too. That's the main point, brothers and sisters. That's the grand assurance of Jesus' resurrection. We should look at the resurrection of Christ. We should look at the empty tomb. And we should say in our hearts, if God can raise Jesus, then God will raise me. That's Paul's point. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. But now, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ's at his, at his coming. I love the point that he makes there. He says, look, you need to understand death is in the world because of one man. Death is in the world because Adam sinned, right? When Adam's, everything was perfect in the Garden of Eden, it was a perfect existence with God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Everything was right in the Garden of Eden, and then one man sinned, and then the world became corrupted. Then death entered the world. We all die because of what Adam did. Paul will say later in Romans 5, we all die ultimately because all have sinned too. But he says, he says the inverse of that is all, all will be raised because of what Christ did. He is the first fruits. He's the first fruit on the tree, right? He's the first resurrected one, but there's more to come. From the beginning of the Bible story, the Bible teaches us that sin brings death. We have death in the world because of sin. And as far as we've seen, as far as our perspective is concerned, death, death is final. Death is an obstacle that we can't overcome and an obstacle we can't do anything about. Death, death means life is over forever. That's what we've seen. We put loved ones in the ground and, and they stay there. They don't come back. But the promise, the promise of the resurrection, the promise of Scripture is that one day, one day everyone comes back. Every single person. Revelation 20 and verse 12, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things 
which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. I want you to think about how amazing that is. I want you to think about how amazing the promise of Scripture is that one day everyone comes back. Everyone comes back. That's your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents and your great-great-grandparents. That's the child that you lost. The brother or sister that you lost. All the great people from history too. Plato and Socrates and Alexander the Great. Genghis Khan. I don't think it's going to go well for him. Martin Luther King Jr. Everyone comes back. Everyone comes back and they're judged. They're judged. That's the promise of Scripture. That's the confidence we have with the empty tomb. That everyone rises from the dead. And it's important that we say this. It's not just that all will rise. But, and it's important that we're clear on this. But those who are saved by Christ and were faithful unto death, they will rise and they will be changed. That's the promise of Scripture. That when I rise, I will be changed. That's 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. You don't go to heaven in the body that you have now. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's important that we stop. And for a second, we just be in awe of what's promised there. Paul writes, he says, we will, we will not sleep, but we will be changed. We will not sleep, but we will be changed. And I think it's really, really special the way that the Holy Spirit through Paul talks about the resurrection, the way that he talks about death. What he says is that, is that right now, right now, death, death is just sleep. It's just like what you did last night. That those people you know, those people you love, those people that you buried with great tears uh, because God is powerful, because God can raise the dead, it's like they're just sleeping. Because one day they all will rise. And then he says this next, he says, this perishable must, must become imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. And I think that's special too, because what that shows us, what that shows us is that our bodies will be changed. We will put on the glory of God, and what, whatever that looks like, Often we have this mistaken idea of the resurrection that, that our, our, our souls rise from the ground and our bodies stay there. That's not the promise. The promise is that your body rises from the ground and it is changed. This mortal puts on immortality. So the hope of Scripture, the hope of the resurrection is not escape from your body. It is the changing of your body. Into something imperishable and immortal. And then this especially is true. He says that when this happens, death, death is swallowed up in victory. We live in a world that is ruled by sin and death. And everything you hate about this world and everything you dislike about this world can be blamed on sin and death. They are the cause. They're the cause of everything. 
And what Paul writes when he writes in 1 Corinthians 15 is, is that, that when we are changed, when we're changed, death is swallowed up in victory. You know what that means? That means we leave behind. We are done with. There is no more of anything that is connected with sin and death. No more of any of that. No more at all. Do you ever stop to think about what that would be like? No more of anything connected to sin and death. I stopped last week in my office and I just made a list. I wrote down just whatever first came to my mind. All the things connected to sin and death that we don't have to deal with anymore. Let me read this for you. When death is swallowed up in victory, that means I mean, no more anxiety, no more anger, no more asthma, no more Alzheimer's, no more breaks, no more uh, bruises, no more boo-boos, no more cat skins. <laughs> I said that wrong. Cat scans. No more COVID. No more cancer. No more depression. No more disabilities, physical or mental. No more deformities. No more dysfunction. No more exhaustion. We don't get tired. How about this? You get on board with this? No more elections. You ready for that? No more fear. No more funerals. No more guilt. No more graves. No more hurricanes or hearing aids. No more health insurance premiums. No more identity theft. No more jealousy. No more killing. No more lies. No more mental illness. No more medicine. No more measles. No more neglect. No more narcissism. And I can't verify this, but... I'm hoping it's true. No more neckties. No more overdoses. No more pain. No more prescriptions. No more pills. No more questions. No more quarantines. No more racism. No more road rage. No more sexual assault or suicide or shooting sprees or shame. No more tears. No more unmet expectations. No more vulgarity or vulnerability, no more weakness, no more weariness, no more walkers, no more wheelchairs, and no more worrying about trying to come up with things you don't like that start with X, Y, and Z. The Apostle John, when he wrote the book of Revelation, he had a list that was a little bit more succinct than mine. He said this, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. That's our promise. That's our reward. No more of anything connected to sin and death. Death swallowed up in victory. And the question is, how can I be sure that that's true? How can I be sure that God can do that, that that's really going to happen? And the answer is, the answer is that Jesus rose from the dead. And if Jesus rose from the dead, then I can have confidence, I can be assured, I can have a real and substantial and valid hope that I will rise too. And that if I was saved by Christ, and if I was faithful unto death, I will be rewarded with a life that is eternal and wonderful and perfect. That's what the resurrection of Jesus proves. That's our grand assurance. The reward is worth sacrifice. Paul has one more verse in 1 Corinthians 15. It's the last verse in verse 58. And it starts with this word. It starts with therefore. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Paul says that because you have this confidence and because you have this assurance, it should change the way you live life. If you really are holding tight to it, should change everything about what life looks like for you. 
when you hold on to your confidence, your assurance, then it should, it should make you, it should make you steadfast and immovable. We live in a world and we have an enemy who is always constantly trying to move us away from God, trying to get us to, to abandon him. And he uses all kinds of different methods to do that, right? He tries to discourage us and tell us, you know what? You'll never please God. Just stop trying. He tries to make us doubt. You know, can you really believe that God's there? He tries to entice us. You know, if you leave God, you can have this nice thing. He tries to move us away from God. But if we hold tight to our hope and our assurance, knowing that the resurrection is coming, then we will stand immovable. There's nothing that will move us away from God because we know that nothing is worth moving away from God. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? We know that Christ was raised. And that means that no matter how difficult it is, no matter how challenging it is, the reward of standing with God immovable is so worth it. He says, you will be steadfast and immovable, but you'll also be, you'll be always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, sometimes I think we look at the Christian life like we're hunkering down in a bomb shelter, right? I've been saved by Christ. I've got into the bomb shelter, and now I just gotta, I just gotta wait it out. And, you know, wait out my time on earth. Hope a bomb doesn't fall on my head and kill me. Just stay away from all the sin. Make sure I show up to church and, and don't commit sexual immorality and stop cussing. And just, just wait out my time on earth. But that's not the picture that the Bible paints. It's not a bomb shelter. It's more like, more like a vineyard. What we are, what we are is, is workers in Christ's field. And we are here as, as servants as laborers, as workers, we are here to gather in the sheaves. We're here to reap the harvest that Jesus said was white. We're here to devote ourselves to his purpose for our entire lives. To be about his business, to work on his mission, to seek and save the lost like he did. And that's a lot of work. And it requires a lot of sacrifice. We have to give up a lot of things in order to do the work that God wants us to do. But if we, if we have confidence in our reward, we'll give up anything so that we can always abound in the work of the Lord. Give up anything to do that. It's hard to be immovable when you're not sure or not certain. And it's hard to work diligently when you doubt whether or not the reward will be worth the sacrifice. But when we look at the resurrection of Christ, we know with certainty that our toil in the Lord is not in vain, that our work is worth the sacrifice. You know, we were very careful to say earlier that while all mankind will rise on the last day, that it's only a certain group of people, only a certain group of people who are changed and who inherit eternal life. Now, Jesus told us, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm never going to say again, I'm never going to take you anywhere else. I'm sorry, because I'm going to take you somewhere else. Go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, Jesus told us that, that the, the, the resurrection day is different depending on how you lived your life, depending on the choices that you made. And in John chapter 5, starting in verse 28, Jesus said this. He talked to us about the two options we have. The two ways resurrection day can go for me. He said, verse 28, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds, to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. For those who are saved by Christ and are faithful unto death, it is a resurrection of life, but a resurrection of judgment for those who have never been saved by Christ. Or, or who ultimately abandoned him in the way they lived their lives. I implore you this morning. I implore you to believe that you will be raised one day. And to do what's necessary today to make sure it is a resurrection of life for you. The Bible tells us how we may be saved by Christ. The Bible tells us that we need to believe that he is the son of God. And that if we believe he's the son of God, we'll repent of our sins. Because we know those sins caused him to go to the cross. 
And if we believe that he is the Son of God, then we'll confess our belief before men. And if we believe he's the Son of God, then we'll do what he told us to do, to have our sins washed away. We'll be baptized in water for the remission of our sins. If you need to do that, make sure that your resurrection is a resurrection of life today. We'll help you if you'll come to the front while we stand and while we sing. Oh, one